So he got ready to walk away. I said, wait a minute, hold it, Bruce. Let me show you how it's done. Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in for episode 20 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only weekly podcast dedicated to bringing you amazing stories from traditional martial artists. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also the founder of Whistlekick, makers of the best sparring gear on earth, as well as great apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. You can learn more about all of our products, including our newest one, Whistle Bar, the only nutrition bar made specifically for martial artists. They're great for adding protein to your diet, or when you just want something quick on your way to training at the studio. You can learn more about them and everything else we do at whistlekick.com, and you can learn more about the show, including all the past episodes, show notes, and a whole bunch more, all for free, over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're on our website, don't forget to sign up for the newsletter full of information, discounts, and lots of other useful martial arts content. If you're an Android user, you can check out our new Android app on the Google Play Store. Just search for Whistlekick. It's an easy way to stay connected with the show, and it's free. And now to the episode. This week's episode is with Grandmaster Victor Moore. Grandmaster Moore has led an exciting life and is a walking encyclopedia full of reference to the martial arts landscape in the 60s and 70s. He's trained with numerous greats and fought and won against a ton of names you'll recognize. I was in absolute awe just recording this episode. Now, to be fair, some of Grandmaster Moore's claims are huge. In fact, they're big enough that I had to check them out. But I can honestly tell you, this guy is the real deal. He's the Jackie Robinson of martial arts, and someone that every martial artist should know about. And with that... Grandmaster Moore, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Yes, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you here. I'm looking forward to hearing some of your great stories, and I'm sure the people listening are as well. But I'd love for you to start by telling us how you got started in the martial arts. Okay, well, we got to go back many, many years, back to 1950, before most of you guys was born. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just a young jitter snapper, and uh, my older brother, he used to grab, grab on me and swing me around and all, and one of the bigger boys, uh, said he's going to teach me some uh, jiu-jitsu. I say, some what? He say, jiu-jitsu. I say, what is jiu-jitsu? I couldn't say it, Harlan. <laughs> he said, well, it teach you how to fall and how to throw. I said, well, we all know how to fall. Everybody know how to fall. All you do is fall. He said, no, you got to learn how to fall safely. Your brother starts slinging you around, you'll know how to fall. So we had to, uh, he proceeded showing me how to do break falls, ukemi. And I started falling. He showed me the correct way how you had to roll and how you had to slam the ground because we didn't have mats. You know, so we were working on the grass outside there mainly. And that was the beginning. So grabbing and doing some of the holes and the locks and the toes and all. So that was my little beginning. And going to the YMCA also, one of the uh, directors, he was showing a little judo. I say, well, I know some of that juju stuff. He say, no, this is judo. It's a little bit different. You wear a garment here, and you've got to hold it a certain way. Well, in jujitsu, we just grab a person and grab them by the hair and take them down or anything we can get hold of. Well, judo is more of a systemized sport, art. Well, how does it differ? So that's how I got started in my judo. So here I'm a young kid going... Uh, growing up, doing judo and jiu-jitsu, and at the same time, uh, lifting weights at the YMCA at an early age. At the house, I had a coal bucket, because we had to carry coal to keep the house warm from the basement up to the first floor. 
I have a bucket, and I used to curl with it and lift big chunks of coal. So it was kind of a treat to be at the YMCA to be able to lift weights yeah. and learning all this uh, judo and jujitsu stuff combination. So I started tackling my brother. <laughs> so he was pretty amazed that I could keep up with him now and sling him around, being that I was getting uh, stronger as a young age and doing all this judo and jujitsu. And I just kept with it year after year, going to Cub Scout meeting, Boy Scout meeting, and showing some of the scouts some of the same stuff. I started being the, kind of the head kid around, because uh, I knew some jiu-jitsu and judo and all. We didn't have karate back then. Then... Uh, uh, but I don't want to gloss over that because I think that's that's an important point to bring up. So, what year is this that you're saying there wasn't that's, any I karate? Back in 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, and year after year. Then in um, oh, around 50, uh, well, it was 56 when I started the actual karate classes. Uh, Oyama, he had came over here in the late 50s and all, and he was demonstrating karate. Well, this was something new to pretty much everyone. You know, who's this guy? He's supposed to have killed a bull with his bare hands, and he's throwing kicks and punches. I say, this guy doing some dirty fighting if he's using his feet, because when I was coming up, you couldn't spit. You couldn't slap, and you couldn't kick, and you never hit a girl. That was the rule of fighting. Right. Well, this guy was kicking and slapping bulls and everything else, so I said, I think I would like to learn some of that stuff. Nowhere in town, the city of Cincinnati, had any karate or judo at the time. And one day, going out in my backyard, looking up on the hill from my house where we were living at, there was a fellow doing these karate moves, which I learned later was katas and doing basic techniques. Name was Ron Williams, older gentleman. He was, uh, as his occupation, he does graze for a living. So we nicknamed him the grave digger. And I went up the hill and watching him and saying, well, he's doing different stuff. He's doing stuff like that guy was demonstrating on TV. And... I asked him if I could uh, do some of that with him, show me, son, no, get away, kid, you're too young. Oh, come on, I want to learn some. I kept bugging him every day when I got in from school. He's up there, so I would go up the hill, and we are just out in the woods because, you know, there was no dojos at the time. There wasn't no mats and stuff of that nature, so everything was just outside in the woods, on the grass. And I kept bugging him and bugging him till he finally decided he's going to teach me a lesson. So he got this young boy over there and started kicking and punching and had me doing all kind of exercise, hitting on trees, climbing uh, up trees and doing pull-ups on branches and stuff. And I'm asking, is all this necessary? He said, yeah, you got to be in shape. And we always had to clear off a, a part that we were working in, uh, working out in. We had to bow. Well, I was familiar with the bowing procedures and all. So, where's the mat set? We don't work on mats. Work outside in the 
in the grass. Hmm. So that was the beginning. So I'm chopping on trees. And back in the days, you had to harden your hand to learn karate. That was all part of it. And I got to be pretty good at it. He seen he wasn't going to get me to quit, that I kept coming back. So doing all these hard exercises and push-ups and and throwing punches at me and kicks and all, and I'm taking it. I was pretty rugged and tough as a little young jitter snapper myself. So he uh, decided he would teach me. I would be his uh, guinea pig, his uki. And he had a younger brother. The younger brother decided that he wanted to do it also. So we became his students. Of course, back then, the instructors trained pretty much for themselves. Sure. And you just kind of followed along. And he would have you doing stuff. But he's going to use you to throw the punches. <laughs> and you better be blocking or else you're going to get knocked on your can. Be- being an Uki was a whole different experience back then, it sounds like. Everybody had to go through that back in the days, as we've seen. So that was my uh, beginning, and that was, he was showing, he had learned in the military, he had just gotten out of the military. And as he was saying, everybody in the military had to learn this stuff here. They had to learn how to beat the Japs and all. And we had to use this hand-to-hand combat and stuff. And we was able to go to different schools. We met different masters. And and we was able to uh, train in different styles. We went here and there and traveling around the world. We was able to learn different types of uh, Kempo, as it was called back then. So uh, one day he would show us on the soft system, which was very uh, different than the uh, hard system. Another day he's showing us the hard system. Mm -hmm. Showing us the soft system, we had to learn all about the body, pressure points, nerve centers, where to strike, how to strike, how to pinch, as to say, how to hook a finger, and this and that. Had to get a bucket, fill it full of sand. Had to poke your fingers down in the sand. They're supposed to be toughening up your hand, which it did, strengthening your fingers, learning how to uh, hold your fingers together for what is known as nukite. Yeah. And uh, then we had a little. Well, we had another bucket full of little rocks and stuff. We had to punch on that on the hard days. So toughening your hands was also just as much part of karate as your stances and blocks and strikes. It certainly sounds like it was a, a different world back then. You know, now we're we we talk about protective gear, you know, of course, whistle kick makes protective gear and training on mats. And here you are outside, not even using, you know, a maca water, you're using a bucket of rocks and, and sand and you're training on the ground. And, and we had to uh, learn how to hit hard. We had to hit trees, as I said. Right. We had to knock the bark off of trees. <laughs> but then we turn around and we had to learn how to spar and make light contact or hard contact or in no contact. Sure. What you mean sure, no they... contact? Even though we're learning how to kill, self-defense, it wasn't nothing about sport. There was no tournaments back then. So everything was geared toward self-defense on the street if you're going to be attacked or if the Japs are going to come back over here and try and take over our country, we have to know how to defend ourselves. But in practice, we had to learn how to pull our punches. Sure. So we had to be able to throw a full focus blow and stop short of contact without hitting. 
And on another day, we had to make light contact. Another day, hard contact. Another day, no contact. So we had to learn control because if we didn't learn control, we would kill each other. Right. And we had to show that we could kill each other by being able to beat on hard trees and rocks and dig our hand into the sand every day. And he gave me a, a set of files, hard files, and I had to beat my hand on these hard files to toughen up my hand. And my hand, as a young, did a snapper. I'm How old are you at this time? I'm 13, 14 years old. Okay. And I'm built solid as a rock from all this uh, weightlifting at the YMCA, you know, lifting heavy coal buckets at the house and yeah. doing all these exercises and all. Well, my parents didn't take too much of a liking to all this uh, rough training and abuse that I was had to go through. And now beating my hands on hard files and... and Boy, are you crazy? What are you doing? You know? And why are you beating your hands like that? And you're already jigging them in the sand. So that was kind of naive to them. But this was all part of the training that we had to go through. And I had developed my hands. I had callus on my knuckles after a couple of years and had my hands tough. And then, Jeremy, one day we're traveling uptown, going shopping, and there was opening a judo school. Oh, Dad, stop the car. No, we can't stop here. Well, you know where we're at. We're up here uptown in the white section of town where black folks didn't go. You go through town, there are certain stores that let you do some shopping there. You can't get out here, boy. Oh, but there's a judo school. I I want to go in there. You know you can't go up here. That was the hmm. help. And one day, I got on my bicycle, and I went on uptown. I wanted to go in this white man's place of business, which was a no-no back in the days. Now, this is the early 60s now. And here's a judo school opening up. And I went up there a couple of times and asked him if I could come in. Well, okay, hesitant, let me come in. I want to participate. Pretty much had to take a vote of Poland with his students, his handful of students, five or six people, white people on the judo mat. I already know some of the judo. You do? What do you know? I know my Yukimi. Let me see. So I taking my shoes off and getting on the mat and I'm doing my break falls, backward break fall, forward break fall, side break fall, roll break fall. Hmm, how you learn that? How you know that? Well, I had a fellow showing me. I've been doing this a long time. I also know some karate. We don't do karate here. So they let me join the judo school. And there again, I become the uke, and I'm the one that everybody come up to and throw <laughs> to practice their toes. So it's a good thing I knew my break falls very well. I very <laughs> seldom got a chance to throw the white boys, but they all throwing me, so I'm the one that was their guinea pig, you might say. And I took it very well. I was pretty much disciplined. Because my parents were strict disciplinarian, and this Ron Williams that was showing me this karate was a strict disciplinarian. So I could take it. I was already indoctrinated into the strict discipline, the bowing, the yes, and say, and that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So they 
took a liking to me and acceptance to me. And as I said, at this time, blacks didn't go into a white man establishment. And then to be grappling and throwing people, a black person throwing a white person was not too well accepted. But in the judo school, it was okay. So that was a, a big beginning. And there we had Matt. And uh, I was practicing in my karate gi. I didn't have a, a judoka gi. I had uh, only a karate gi, so I had to uh, get me a judo gi. The judo instructor was uh, Ray Hughes. So that was my first official judo instructor, you might say, in a dojo. So there was a lot more rules that we had to go through, cleaning the floor and uh, cleaning the windows and sure. sweeping the mat. And yes, sir, hook two, three, four, you know. So I was indoctrinated real good with it, and being that I could show all the right discipline, uh, I was uh, shown the foes just as well as anybody, and I was already versed with a lot of it, learning new counters and stuff. So I became very efficient. There, Harvey Eubanks and Bill Dimitri came in, and they wanted to start a karate program. Another Kempo program, Japanese Kempo. And later it was called uh, Shotokan. And uh, Harvey Eubanks was doing Goju karate. And I, and this opened up in the back room of the judo school because there was no karate schools. And as you ask any of us old-timers, you know, we started our karate in the back room of judo school. Somebody would come in and start teaching a little karate. So It's quite the turnaround from the way things are now, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So everything was judo, and I had been accepted into a judo school. Now here they're doing this karate that I like more so. And... They had to accept me into the karate group, which they only had a handful of guys, four or five guys in the karate program, so they accepted me in. Again, blacks didn't go into the white man establishment and mingle with their group, and here you're going to be throwing blows for white people. Mm, had to think about that, but I was accepted in. My discipline was real strict. I would... Uh, Stay and sweep and clean and show a lot of good discipline. We're learning Goju karate. And say he had another style of karate that he wanted to be the dominant one teaching this uh, other Japanese karate. Well, tension grew. Because what style of karate were we going to be studying? And it seemed that uh, Bill Dimitri won over most of us with the uh, more of the Shotokan style of karate than the Goju style. And the Shotokan more or less became the dominant style of karate in a way that we would conduct ourselves. Mm-hmm. And then a gentleman from China, Chong Wing, came to the University of Cincinnati as an exchange student, and he had a total different system, but it was familiar to me because it was of the Chinese system, soft circular moves, heel hand blocking and striking and fingertip poking and gouging, 
and sweeping and circular motion and all. Oh, yeah, I'm familiar with this. Well, what year was this? Beg pardon? What year was that with the, with the Chinese oh, gentleman? Around 62 or so, 63, okay. 62. And here he was as an exchange student at the University of Cincinnati, and he would come down on certain days and and start showing us this form of karate that is said to be the first form of karate ever. Well, what is that? That's Chinese font. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, his training was harder than even Bill Dimitri. His became the more dominant style, even though the students, we have to kind of <clears throat> choke up and look wide-eyed and see if we're going to go through it and take it. We was getting beat with a bamboo stick. We're already doing push-ups, but now we're doing fingertips and wrist push-ups, knuckle push-ups, and we're jumping and lifting a leg up over a rope, and we had to spar with our legs tied together. Mm. You can't be running. You can't be moving. You start off with maybe two feet distance away from each other with the uh, OB or a rope tie your feet and then you had to tie one leg together so you had to learn how to throw hook kicks crushing kicks upside somebody's head and you're right there nose to nose with them but that proved to be very beneficial throughout my future uh, karate career I think that's why I was able to win so many tournaments and uh, throw such good kicks, hook kicks, scissors kicks, and drop kicks and all because of that close-in fighting. We had to learn to fight on our knees. We had to learn to fight laying down. We, hey, he said, uh, you're not going to always be standing, and you got to learn how to fight from any position. Well, with three forms of karate trying to take place in a dojo, uh, who's going to be the dominant one? He seemed to have uh, been the dominant one, but eventually the school finally folded, broke up, and I went searching around the city of Cincinnati trying to find another judo or karate school, and there was a judo school out on Reading Road, uh, Glenn Osborne, he uh, had a nice big judo program going. And I jumped into that, and then all of a sudden, here come a fellow by the name of Jim Wax, and he's teaching another style of karate, showing root. Hmm. And yep. he had a master that he had studied from, Anse Yushiro. And these karate instructors, back in the days, as we can say, without any hesitation, <laughs> was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to see how fast they can get the students to quit. There was no... See how many students you can get. It was an attitude of how long are they going to stay. And you would start off with a nice little number, maybe a dozen or two, but you end up with only four or five students because everybody had to quit. The training was just too rough, too strict. And we had to go outside on the tar and run around barefooted, taking laps around the dojo. Inside the dojo, where karate was being taught, was always on a hardwood floor. That's why a lot of our old timers, we preferred hardwood floor because that's what we were trained on. Right. 
So this is this is probably the the best martial arts uh, origin story that I've that I've ever heard. And I know you've got a ton of other stories, and I want to make sure that we have time for some of those. So I I want you to take a moment and think. What is your best story? If you only had one story to tell, and you'll have a chance to tell tell some others, but <laughs> we could boil it off to just one. What would you say your best story is? Oh, I'm laughing at it because uh, you're the answer that had always come to my mind, and that was the uh, first Grand National USKA tournament in the United States. One of the first tournaments in the United States was in 63 up in Chicago, Dr. Robert Trias World Championships, and then 64, uh, uh, likewise in Chicago, and then 65, he changed the name and to the, from the World Championships to the Grand National, so that was the first Grand National tournament, which was held in Miami, Florida in 1965. And uh, people had been invited from all over the world. And there was this one fellow, Big Mike Foster. Y'all don't hear too much about Big Mike Foster, but back there in the days, that was the man. He was so six, six, a giant, weighing 270. By my pounds, worked from a kibidachi at a straddle stand and snuck his feet in, we go in on you, throw a side kick and you couldn't get away from it because you would be up against the uh, line. You would be outside the line. He had such power, he was breaking people's ribs and all. Hard contact was permitted, but not death match. <laughs> right. What's the darn difference? <laughs> Back in the days there, the ambulance used to be right outside and the stretches be right at the door, and there were several people rolled out. Well, Big Mike Foster was undefeated. He had won all his tournaments over in Japan. He was Dr. Shitoshi bodyguard, entourage, when he came to the United States. There was four or five of them, and he traveled around with them. He won the tournaments up in Canada, because Canada had more tournaments than, well, they were the first ones oh, uh, to have tournaments before even the United States did, because we used to travel up to Canada and compete. At uh, Sirocco uh, tournaments. I think Gary Alexander and people like that may remember some of them first tournaments and then Chicago. Well, this was one of the biggest tournaments in the United States because it had been growing. People there from uh, Canada, Venezuela, Japan, Korea. And there's Big Mike Foster. And he had done got down to the finals, and I had gotten to the finals. And I was weighing in about 170 pounds, 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, so I was a little midget compared to him. He had 100 pounds on you. Now, back in the days, Jeremy, we didn't have weight division. Okay. This day and time, y'all got all these different weight divisions and so many divisions that everybody wins a trophy. Everybody is only three and four people in a division. Where back then we had fifteen and twenty people in your division that you had to uh, go through before you can even place. Well, I was in the finals. He was in the final. We down to the final match and. I done seen how he's knocking everybody out and breaking ribs and carrying on. Well, I used to go up into a crane stance in a crouch, and I bring my hand up in a U-T-U uh, position, inside middle block position, holding out at a 45, 
other hand down on the cross so I could cover and bring my knee up almost to my chest. So you couldn't get in on me. I was hard to uh, be able to get in on. But I remember this match because he was so powerful. He come in on me. He'd do one crossover and throw that sidekick. And he hit my arm. And there was so much force, I sailed out of the ring. <laughs> I said, oh, shoot. <laughs> this ain't going to work. <laughs> I came back in. I jumped up on his leg. He fell from the key, but I see I swung around to his back. I chopped him on the neck. I dropped down. I went through his legs, did drop kicks. I jumped up, did jump kicks. I was all over him <laughs> like a mice on a elephant, Master Trier said. Master Trier said he never seen so many techniques thrown on a person in his whole life. He said that was the best match he had ever seen in his life. And, and it paints quite the visual. I, I can I can imagine you uh, well, taking all these shots on this large man. I said, I can't let him touch me. And I knew how to sweep, but he was too powerful to be swept, so I had to jump on him. I threw jump kicks. I threw drop kicks. I had to do ridge hand chops. I did all kind of techniques, and I ended up beating him. And that placed me as the first African-American Grand National Champion in the world. Wow. The first USKA Grand National Champion. So a lot of my titles stem from that match. The newspaper did a lot of interviews on me. There's a jump kick I did for them that is circulating on YouTube here and there. Mm -hmm. So that was one of my most devastating matches. I mean, because I knew if he had a, been able to hit me, he would probably took my lights out. But sure. with all the different techniques that I was throwing, that was one of the most exciting uh, matches. Now, I got quite a few of them, but that was one of the first ones and most exciting. But back in the days... Um, Jeremy, there were so many good fighters. There was, oh, people from New York like Thomas the Puppet and uh, uh, Ron Van Cleef and Artie Simmons, Jimmy Jones and out of, from Chicago and out of Rocky Mountain region, uh, Rex Perone. And out on the West Coast, there was Steve Sanders, Muhammad now is his name. There were just so many good fighters. George Billman over in Pennsylvania, and Glenn Keeney from Indiana, Bob Bowes running Kata, and, and oh, it was just so many good fighters. Uh, Alan Steen, Chuck Norris, Joe Lewis, Mike Stone. Well, when we went to a tournament, all of these guys just about are there. <laughs> Nowadays, you go to a tournament, you may be one or two, you know, good champions there, and everybody else is from down the street and around the corner. His neighbor, his dojo, you know, there's really no competition. But back then, in the 60s, in the early 70s, Everybody was there. There was tournaments almost every week, but there is the same people. Now, you talk about, well, this is a national tournament. This is a world tournament. This, they have tournaments nowadays they label as world championships, and there's nobody there from another country, nobody there from hardly from anybody even from another state. Everybody's from the same neighborhood just about, and they call it a, a world tournament. Right. Well, back then, 
there be people from all over the darn country and different parts of the world. But you have so many champions, just for you to place in a tournament, you done something. Right. It wasn't a matter that you win, it's that you place. And if you place, wow, my hat's off to you. So that's so, what we had to go through and uh, coming up in tournaments. You but, just rattled off a, a, a ton of great names, uh, names that I'm sure people listening will, will know quite well. Um, but one of the things that's clear for anybody that knows you or, or has talked to you or, or I guess knows your history is a better way to put it, knows that you sparred with and, and beat everyone else. beat all of these people. So I'd like you to take a minute and and tell us about that. That um, you know, as I as I researched about you, you know, of course we spoke last week, but uh, well, I spent some time uh, just to spit out a few names. Let's go back uh, 1965. As I said, beating Big Mike Foster, he had never been defeated. I'm the only one and first one to defeated him for years and years, but at that time he had never been defeated. That's in 65. In and how? 66, I defeated uh, the All-Hawaiian Champion at Daniel Pye's tournament, which was the uh, USKA World Championship in 66. So there I was, you know. Then in 67, uh, Bruce Lee had... Uh, Challenge us national champions at the international to a speed match to see who was the fastest, and that came about because he had been making movies and people was asking how fast is he for real? Is that all real? And and how good is he? Well, his promoters wanted to prove that he could stand up against us national champions. Well. Ed Parker had stated that he have a movie star here, Bruce Lee, and he challenged any of us national champions to a speed match to see how fast he really is. Well, nobody jumped at his challenge as who want to get up there. Everybody more or less was shunning him. As some of the guys were saying, well, who's he? He's never defeated anybody. He ain't got no name. He's a movie star. <laughs> What's in it for us? Money? Maybe a movie role. <laughs> that was the whole talk. Now, here's all these super champions out there, and everybody's looking around. Who is this guy? You know, he's a movie star. That's Kato. Let's bring on him. Well, what's in it for us? <laughs> well... Ed Parker was getting a little disgusted, and he says uh, he was walking by where our USKA group was, and he looked over at Robert Trias, Grandmaster Robert Trias, who brought karate to America in 1946, who was my main sensei, and, and to this day I give him credit for making me a super champion. He says, Bob, nobody's accepting this challenge. Maybe he's just that fast. Robert Trier says, huh, I got some guys right here. There's uh, Artie Simmons, Jimmy Jones, and Vic Moore, my three top men here. Either one of them, I bet, can keep up with him. You think so? Ain't nobody jumping to his uh, challenge. Master Trier says, yeah, I know so. Ed Parker says, well, put one of them up. Master Trier says, one of you guys going up there. Show this guy who we really are. We wave our hand, ah, now you go, now nah, you go, Jimmy Jones, now nah, you go, Jimmy Jones, oh, Vic, you go, Vic, oh, no, what do you say, you go. Either one of us, all three of us had the same speed, all three of us were super champions, Artie oh, Simmons, one of the fastest guys in the country, and Jimmy Jones from Chicago, just as fast, and Vic Moore, me, from uh, Cincinnati, all. When we went to tournaments, a lot of times they would say, all three of us here is no need for us to even compete because one is going to get first, one's going to get second, one's going to get third. They called us the three musketeers. We beat every tournament we went to. I placed in every tournament that I've competed in. Well, so 
Massachusetts knew who we were, and he said, uh, why don't y'all get on up there? Again, we weigh not. Vic, get on up there. I was sitting on the end. I waved my hand. He said, Vic, get up there. Well, <laughs> he went running up there. When your instructor speaks, you better get the move. That's how yes, much the truth were. <laughs> so I get up there, and Bruce Lee says he's going to step back four paces. He's going to come in and going to hit me in the chest. Not hard. You just tag me, you know, and I won't be able to touch it. And I said, Repeat that, you know, pretty much for the crowd. Everybody started laughing, you know. And he repeated, and I said to myself, now how in the world are he going to get back and come in and hit me in the chest, and I ain't going to be able to touch it? That's I, I said to myself, lightning is fast, but I damn near keep up with it. Well, he gets back, and he said, you ready? I said, yes. He comes in, lightning speed, punches at my chest, and I blocked it with an Agashi U. Boom, one of the fastest blocks we got. Bam, and I'm already fast. The whole crowd, woo, wow, did you see that? Big more block in. And Bruce Lee's a little bit embarrassed. He says, well, boy, we'll try it again. He gets back, he comes in, I see his ear move, his eye flinch. He's coming in, right hand, here he comes. He comes in at lightning speed, and I blocked it even faster. Bam! The whole crowd stomping, hollering, Woo, Vic Marvel! Well, Bruce Lee is embarrassed. He reached out and tapped me on my right arm and said, Boy, you're fast. You're one of the fastest Americans I've ever seen. Well, they were stomping, so he said, "We'll, We'll go again. But he never asked me if I was ready, which was okay. I glanced off with my eyes because somebody up in the audience had stomped. There's a whole bunch of noise. And I just kind of glanced off with my eyes. At this time, he flashed at my head with a backhand strike. And then it never came close enough, but I had just swung at it like the head of a fly. And he steps in close like he might have was close enough to hit. And I started laughing at him, and I said, now, what is that? You seen I wasn't ready. And I took my finger, and I pointed, and I said, now, you, and I pointed at him, I said, you're supposed to be punching to the chest, and here you are trying to sneak one in at the head. And I bent over, and I'm laughing at him, you know, and I just bowed to him, said, okay, I'll give you that one then, you know. He said, well, <laughs> So he got ready to walk away. I said, wait a minute. Ho, ho. Hold it, Bruce. Let me show you how it's done. Oh, well, uh, that's okay. I said, no, no, come on. You do your punch. I'm going to give you that one. You saying I blocked the two. Now you just tried to sneak that one in your head. Now I'm going to show you how it's done. You blocked mine. So I get back the same distance, and I come in. I said, you ready? He said, yes. I come in. You get light. See the light of your body the quicker you can move. A lot of times people ask me how you move so fast, how you win so many tournaments and all this. The lighter your body, the quicker you can move. Now, if you all tense and you hard and you gritting your teeth and think you're going to hit so hard, you slowing yourself down. Does that make sense to you? It does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm loose. I'm loose as a goose. I'm just so light. I say, you ready? I move in, and I hit him in the chest, boom, and I'm out. He missed. He's swinging. He missed. I said, hmm, okay. I said, we'll go again. Well, okay. So he's ready, boy. He's he's live. He's in. I moved in lightning speed. I hit him harder and set him back a step. Boom. He missed again. I said to myself, Woo, wow, boy, you faster than the Green Hornet. Everybody's hooping and hollering, stumping and hollering, and yeah. Bruce Lee about had tears in his eyes. I swear for God on my mother and daughter, my father, did great. Wow. He, he's so embarrassed, he, he wanted to walk away. I said, well, come on, we'll go one more time, Bruce. You went three times, I'll go three. No, that's all right. So he finally said, okay. Well, I was feeling so sorry for him because he was looking so sad and embarrassed. 
I just threw a regular punch just to see if he can block that, which he did. That's why I advertised I beat him four out of six times, giving him that one. Well, one of the fellows, Frank Duke, with the movie Bloodsport was about out in California. He had called me, and he said, did you ever see that one punch that he tried to sneak in at your head? Did you ever notice how far away he was? I said, well, no, he didn't ever come close. Uh, he said, well, slow it down. Look at, Put it on your VCR and slow it down and, and see. He's two feet or so away from you. I said, well, I know you never came close, but I never paid that much attention to it. I looked at it, my feet, and this is still on video of what they show, what his producers show. I'm two foot behind a line. You'll see a line on the floor, and he's two foot on the other side. We four feet distant. He comes in, and he swings with a backhand strike, and it stops two and a half feet away. I said, if he passed that line, I'll give him credit for at least that backhand strike that he tried to sneak on. I wasn't looking. He never even came close enough for that to even count. Because he never even passed that line. And if you see it now, I'm two feet behind the line, so he's two foot away from me. And he only came to the line, so he's two and a half feet away from me. But then he steps up close to me, like he might have been close, which is old Hollywood trick, trying to make it look like you're close enough to hit a person. Right. And I looked at that, and I played it over about 50 times, and I played it over and over and over. Well, the first punch that he threw to my chest, how you tell there's a person walking to his seat in the background, got a white shirt on, and he's going up the bleachers. Uh, when he came in for the second punch, that person in the bleachers with a white shirt, he had crossed over going to his seat, and then he sees. Then you see Bruce Lee pat me on my right arm, you slow it down, freeze it, frame by frame. He's patting me on my right arm. Why is he patting me on my right arm? That's when he's telling me how fast I was. Then yeah. the one punch that they show over and over, like he's getting three and four punches in on me, which is a bow faced tail, never, ever come close. But in the background, there's no more movement. It's the same movement. It's the same but you see me bending over feather and feather, but it's the same punch, the same backhand right. strike. And if you take a marker pen on your camera, I mean your uh, TV or whatever you're looking at, and you put a dot where his head is, where my head is, where his hand is, where my hand is, you'll see it's the exact same spot. So that tells you it's the same punch over mm -hmm. and over. You cannot throw four and five punches in your hair and your head and your every movement on each person is in the same spot. So they edited the footage to because Bruce lost and they didn't want oh, yeah. now, the world to, that, to see that. They don't even show my punches when I hit him. They don't even show that part. Well, wait a minute. Hey. Because they're too fast. Hey, wait a minute. What about the part <laughs> that Big Moore do? Hey, now. <laughs> They could have cleared that up, the punches that I blocked, but from the angle that they wanted to show it from, you can't hardly tell. All you can see is, is some movement, but we both moving so fast, you know. Damn. Yeah. You can't really tell that much. But that one punch, they get it at an angle uh, uh, from a 90-degree um, angle, and it's looking like he's coming close, but as you see on the line, there's uh, uh, some lines on the floor. He never even passed that line. He never would get close to me. And they show that over and over. But people are too gullible. They don't slow it down, put it on slow frame, and go click, 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 and freeze it. And even his one-inch punch is not a one-inch punch. We all got a one-inch punch. Uh, he's doing a... A 12 inch shove, he's pushing the guy, you know, and all this is Hollywood trick stuff, you know, and all. <clears throat> well, his folks called me 
and said, Vic, we're doing a documentary on Bruce Lee. We would uh, like or have different sport people to say something nice. We got actors, we got sport people, we got Hollywood people, you know. And being that y'all had y'all demonstration, if you would say something uh, nice, you know, about Bruce, I'd say, well, what do I get? You know, you're going to give me the footage? Well, yeah, we'll give you the footage if you say something nice. Uh, uh, will you say he beat me? I say, no, you know very well he didn't beat me. The footage will show that much. Now, Bruce Lee and I had did some little sparring because he wanted me to see his Ji Kwon Do. He'd say, Vic, will you look uh, at my uh, Ji Kwon Do here and we'll go around a little bit and you see how you like it. Well, we did, more or less in private, you know. And he's doing that jumping and bouncing and I'm sweeping, spinning and hitting him anytime I want. That's me, that's Vic Moore. Ask anybody. Well, he had the audacity to ask me afterwards, how did I like his Ji Kwon Do? I said, well, Bruce, I don't. As you've seen, I can hit you any time I want. You could never get in on me. And even in our speech, Drew, you see my style, or evidently must have been faster than yours. I said, I'm too much of a traditionalist to like this Ji Kwon Do stuff that you're doing. Oh, well, some of the people like it. And I said, yeah, okay. Well, you don't never see any of that, but you don't even see my punches that I do and hit him, and he missed, and he right. stopped crying. Now, here I am that defeated everybody there is, and people are going to say, oh, ain't no way in the world he could beat Bruce Lee. Who is Bruce Lee? He asked, uh, Chuck Norris was interviewed and said, well, I'm a fighter, Bruce Lee is an actor. Well, be nice, Chuck. Yeah, you know, Chuck Norris could have beat Bruce Lee in a real fight or in a tournament and, and a dozen other uh, champions. I'm not the only one. Artie Simmons could have. Jimmy Jones could have. You know, I mean, there's uh, dozens of people uh, uh, could have beat Bruce Lee. Well, just as fast as Bruce Lee. Well, right. anyway, that was in 67. Same tournament. I defeat Chuck Norris at the International. Chuck Norris, when he get ready to throw his spin and back kick, he moves his right shoulder. It comes forward, and then he makes a spin. Here he comes. He done telegraphs. See, everybody telegraphs. Vic Moore telegraphs, you telegraph, Bruce Lee sure. telegraph, everybody telegraphs. You just got to be able to pick it. Well, that's my expertise. I pick your telegraph when you're going to move, how you're going to move, what foot you're going to kick with, or what hand you're going to punch with. Boom. I, that's another story. I'll tell you how I developed all that uh, on our next interview. Okay. So we come well. with a spinning back kick. Instead of stepping back, blocking like most people try and do, Chuck Norris is too fast for you to block his kick. You step back and think you're going to block it, and you kick your ribs is busted. Boom. Well, I steps in. Just when he spins, I steps in and hit him right to the kidney. Boom. Sent him to the floor. The winning match. The winning point. They stopped the match. Award me the point, but... Uh, uh, Ed Parker said, oh, hey, we got to have a meeting. They go in the in the back room with all the referees and stay 15 minutes, and they come out, and they say, oh, we got to uh, start over, sitting there. And, there. and Chuck Norris raised his hands up to say, well, I don't know what's going on, Vic, you know, boom. And uh, he just hit me on the arm with, with just some little flashy stuff, and he said, oh, pop, pop. And that's it, that's the match, Chuck Swin. When we got ready to leave out, Chuck Norris took his program and said, Vic, now you know I didn't have nothing to do with that. I said, I know it. They cheat. You know, see, back in them days, they cheated. It was prejudice and, and all. I was stopped from even coming to tournaments at times. They wouldn't let me in the hotel where the tournament was. Says, this nigger can't come in, you know, boom, at Master Trius or either the Black Dragon Fighting Society would say, if you don't let this boy in, you don't going to have a tournament because he's the defending champion. Oh, oh well, sometimes, well, he had to go around to the back. <clears throat> no, Master Trey says, no, he's coming in the front like everybody else. That's some of the stuff we had to go through. Well, Chuck Norris took his program and wrote on it to the man that beat me, Vic Moore. Oh, oh so wow. can I do that? Thank you. Yeah, Vic, you know, you know, it was fair. His wife at the time, 
she took her program and she wrote on her program. See, we used to have programs back there in the day, and she wrote on to the man that beat my husband, you know. And, you know, I thank him, you know, gave him a hug, you know, and all. And that's why I say even to this day, Chuck Norris never called us a name. He was always fair and honest, uh, treat everybody with respect, you know. But there was people that called us names and the N-word, you know, in the matches and beforehand wouldn't even let us in. Well, uh-huh. that was in 67. Bam. 68, I defeat Joe Lewis to become the first world professional champion in San Antonio, Texas. We was establishing uh, an official world championship with, hey, pro. Now we're going to be having pros. We're going to have money intervene. Well, I defeated Joe Lewis at that tournament. They don't speak about it much, very seldom. You'll read it once in a while in the history books and all. That's in 68. In 69, Mike Stone, never been defeated. We out in California at the team championships. Mike Stone doing his thing, sweeping in rich hand, sending people airborne, putting them on the stretcher. Doing his same thing, cracking ribs, busting them on the floor. Well, come down to the final tee, and I, boom, there we are. Well, we knew we were going to meet eventually one day. So here we are. I'm a drop kicker. He's a drop kicker. Fred Wren, he's a drop kicker. Uh, Jim Harrison, he's a drop kicker. We're the best drop kickers there were doing the I drop kicked on him. Boom. He blocked it. Boom. I said, what? Boom. You don't block my drop kick. <laughs> I looked up at him. He looked down, gave me a little smile. Boom. Well, we go on. All of a sudden, he drop kicks on me. I blocked it. He looked <laughs> shot. He looked at me. I gave him that same little wink back, you know. And we going back and forth. And then I, he caught me in his trap. He come in with his hook to sweep me. Here come the ridge hand coming at me. I said, oh, Lord, I'm in his trap. Well, knowing judo, and my main judo instructor was John Osaka. I didn't give you that name. But John Osaka was one of the top judo cuts. Anybody in judo know that name, John Osaka. And uh, he had taught me how to counter it just about every throw. And Mike Stone had me in his suite, and I just dropped low. Called him below the calf, reversed it through my shoulder into him, and took my ridge hand inside of his ridge hand and sent him airborne, and he came down on his head and shoulder and dislocated his shoulder. <sighs> oh, they mentioned uh, Mike Stone uh, lost to Vink Moore because he was disqualified. Yeah. How was he disqualified? Did he slip on a banana peel? <laughs> did he step on his shoestring or did he trip getting in the ring and somebody tripped him away? No, they don't mention Vic Moore swept him and threw a rich hand. Yeah, he's great. He was good. I give him credit for all that. Boom. But you just don't win every match. Somebody's going to take you out a time or two. Right. Well, that was in 69. Vic Moore, the only person to defeat Mike Stone as a black belt. In 1970, Bill Wallace and I, Bill Wallace got the fastest feet in the world, clocked at 65 miles an hour. Uh, bon, bon, yeah, well, we good friends. We in the USKA together and all. We fought a few times. And I'm stopping his kicks. I'm telling Master Triss how I'm going to beat him the night before. Master Triss said, I want to see you do it. And I beat him with a rich hand up to the gut, but I looked behind him, and when he turned his head to see what I was looking at, as to say, you know, I threw him off, in other words, I come step in and threw a rich hand. But how was I stopping his kicks? Why? How was I able to play with his ankle, patting him on the feet and hitting him on the on the leg? He was like, you crazy, you? No. I kept my hand across Jeremy, at a 45-degree angle. 
If mm-hmm. I hold my arm across your legs at a 45 degree angle, you can't kick me because you got to bend your knee to be able to kick me. There's no way you're going to kick or kick without bending your knee. Well, if I right. got your knee checked, you can't kick me. Does that make sense to you at all? It does. Try it. Boom. You get with anybody. Or if you had a stick and you have a stick across a person's knee at a 45 degree angle, they can't kick you. Can't throw a front kick, roundhouse kick, back kick, or any kind of kick. But people try and block the leg and step back and duck and dodge and all that. When really you don't have to. But if you are going to block it, then you have to be faster than the person throwing the kick. It's timing. Timing is more important than speed. What good is your speed if you can't hit me? Timing is better than strength. What good is your strength if you can't hit me? When I give my seminars, this is some of the stuff I go over. So if I hold my arm out at a 45 and you're trying to punch me, you got to come around. So only one arm is going to hit me on one side of the body. The other hand can't come around that 45 degree angle. So I check your arms and I check your legs. That's how Vic Moore beat everybody. That's... Well, in 69, Joe Lewis and I, we put on a uh, demonstration of kickboxing on the Murray Griffin national TV show in New York. Joe knew he could always get Vic Moore to fight him because we fought several times, but we was going so hot and heavy that the producers stopped it because they hadn't seen nobody making contact like that in karate. We had gloves on. We're doing kickboxing. And we are the ones that introduced this full contact stunt. And suddenly we had the first full contact match. Joe Lewis and Greg Burns and Vic Moore and Jim Harrison out in California. And that was the first full contact match. Well, these people out in California, they seem to think that the martial arts been started to the 80s because they, all they want to talk about is everybody from the 80s on up. And they started this and they started that and they had the first this and first that. They ain't had the first nothing. We were doing this stuff before they were born. And then they're going to say, Bruce Lee come in here and he talked this and he talked. We were doing the stuff before he was born almost. You know? <laughs> So, Grandmaster Moore, you you went through. I mean, I, I've been jotting down names as you've mentioned them, and it's it's. I don't think I've ever written that many amazing martial artists down on a piece of paper but at one time. It's, I, I, I do <laughs> want to put in my chimpanzee. Vic Moore trained a chimpanzee. The what? chimpanzee went to different tournaments. We went to Chicago. We went to Florida. We went to the Grand Nationals. We went all over just about the United States. I had that chimp out there demonstrating karate technique. Ask Jimmy Jones, ask some of these guys, Thomas LePepper, he's gone, you know. But uh, 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 I just took that chimp to different tournaments to show that I could teach a chimpanzee karate. So not only was I a fighter, but I was a teacher. I taught a lot of super uh, champions. I don't know what they did that. promoted my chimp. So, uh, and then later on, people claim they trained a chimp. You seen this chimp? And they, my chimp, this is back in 1970, 74, 75, you know? Boom. Well, training a chimpanzee to do karate was more challenging than beating Bruce Lee in a speed match. Then there's one guy, he has the audacity to get on YouTube and come out with two DVDs telling people that I'm a liar, that I never beat Bruce Lee because Bruce Lee never fought. So how could I beat him? Well, if you have a race and I beat you in the race, I can say I beat you. If you're playing golf and my score is lower than your score, I can say I beat you. If we in NASCAR and we racing and I get to the finish line, I can say I beat you. Uh, you can do semantics if you want to on the name, but how is he going to tell me I didn't beat Bruce Lee because Bruce Lee was a movie star and he wrote books and crap and everything else? I don't give a darn what he wrote and what he didn't do. I beat him in the speed match, so that's fact. 
So I'd like you to think back over all these these names, all these people that you had a chance to spar or fight or, or whatever term you want to use for it. Did you have a favorite? Was there was there somebody that you enjoyed sparring the most? <laughs> yeah, yes. Yes, sir. Oh, well, you know, I really enjoyed that fight with uh, Big Mike Stone. But Joe Lewis and I, we fought uh, probably more than anybody else. Uh, I think he got three of the matches and I got two. But every time we fought, truthfully, I beat him, but they wouldn't give it to me. But you had fun with him. Oh, because... I would raise my arm out for him to throw a side kick, and I know he's going to take that step over, grab your arm, snatch you in, and break your ribs, you know, boom. Well, I would raise my arm up for him to uh, grab my arm. But when he grabbed my arm, instead of me trying to pull away, which is raising your arm up, I jump in and lower my elbow, and that catches his leg, hurting his leg, <laughs> and then <laughs> I take that same arm that he got hold of, and I done snatch down on it, and then I hit him upside his head, and he gets so mad. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I'm going to kill you, you know, well, we used to have some good battles. Well, Glenn Keeney, he was a good fighter. He, he was, uh, they called him the Fox. He was one of the top fighters. <laughs> He used to make his students, and he trained probably more good fighters than even I did. He was an excellent trainer. He had two guys, uh, Russ Dunn and another fellow, black guy, beat Joe Lewis in full contact. But he used to make his students sit down at my ringside, me and Joe Lewis fighting, and take notes. <laughs> And they had to report back to him on techniques that I was using and doing. <laughs> but we fought a few times. Glenn Keeney was an excellent fighter. I beat him. But I had to beat him uh, so good because he used to study me. He was tricky himself. He was known as the fox. So I had to throw all kind of stuff at him. Uh, Artie yeah. Simmons and I, you had to flip a coin as to who was going to be. You know what, uh, Jeremy, not only did I win, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn and be too boastful and stuff, did I win in Kumite, but I placed in every kata and weapon competition. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute. And one thing, you were reading a couple of the history books, uh, Dr. Melvin Wise was probably the number one kata champion in the 60s and the 70s. And that was a goal to be Well, to win first place when he ain't there and all, taking second place when he's there and maybe a third place because uh, 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 what's my fellow name up there? George Bielman, uh who always gave me competition. Uh, but I always place first, second, or third, or even fourth, in kata and weapons. And for me to be Dr. Melvin Wise, and he put it in one of the history books that the only person ever defeated him in kata was Vic Moore. Hey, my hat's off to myself on that. <laughs> I certainly do that. But that was George Dillman who was a top kata uh, champion. He and I flip a coin, and then we go to weapons. He and I, we had to flip a coin. And then demonstration, I used to, uh, I'm the first one to start laying on the bed of nails and let them break eight inches of concrete and uh, jumping eight foot in the air, breaking an inch board, kicking three times in the air. And there was one Korean, he outdid me. He kicked five times in the air, you know. So, uh, But I won in Tata. I won in weapons. I ran the side most time, even with the boat. And uh, in demonstrations. 
I used to do a lot of breakage. I used to break eight inches of concrete with the side of my hand with a snap of the wrist, not swinging my arm down. I used to break three inches of concrete by having my fingertips on the brick and then snap my wrist. Wow. That's the one and two inch punch, Bruce Lee. So those are some of the things I used to do. Now, there was uh, Bob Bowes, super champion, always gave me competition in Kata. Uh, Heidi Ochai, always gave me competition in Kata. And Glenn Pumier, I don't know if you know that name. He was up around Pennsylvania somewhere up around there. The only burger that I never got chance to beat in Kata, uh, but I've always played second or third, you know, behind him, you know. Yeah. And um, like I said, how do you type? But Bob Bose, he always uh, was one of the top uh, Kata individuals. But uh, the super champions out there, like I said, Thomas LaPepe from New York, um, Ron Van Cleef from New York of there, Jim, uh, Jimmy Jones from Chicago, Artie Simmons from Erie, Pennsylvania, Russ Perron from uh, Colorado, uh, Oklahoma out that way in the Rocky Mountain area, and uh, Steve Sanders Muhammad. All of them were super champions. And then you have the other fellows. Uh, those were the minorities that had to fight super hard to even get uh, a place. Those things mm-hmm. were so prejudiced back in the days. Then you got uh, Chuck Norris and Joe Lewis and Bill Wallace and Mike Stone. Uh, then others, uh, Alan Steen, Skipper Mullen, um, Pat Burleson, uh, Jim Hawks, all them guys that won tournament. Oh my God! If you just placed, you did something. So it wasn't like I said a matter that you win. Oh, it, 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 we hardly ever ask if you win. Is how did you do? Did you place? Yeah. Oh, good. Congratulations. Because <laughs> if you place. That was like a world championship in itself. Nowadays, they got, right. like I said, world championships, and ain't nobody there. Just they're next to a neighbor down the street, around the corner, across town. People have asked me, you know, if you could go back in time, where would you go? And I, I don't, I've never really had a good answer to that question. And I think now I have a great answer. I would go back to one of these tournaments and and see all these people. It never occurred to me that all of you would be. At the same event at the same time. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. You walked in. And we all. Incredible. Now, Joe Lewis and I, we had more battles, and all the old timers will tell you they, they went to tournament just to see us, just to see Joe Lewis and Vic Moore fight. Wow. But we would fight like cats and dogs. And then afterwards, we go going to the restaurant, sitting down, eating a hamburger, and drinking a Pepsi Cola together. And, Wait a minute, I thought. Hey, yeah. Yeah, we fought cats and dogs, but hey, I do what we fought. Hey, we going out to eat together. But you were really friends. Somewhere. <laughs> 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 we tolerated each other, you know. I mean, I cried boo hoo at his funeral, you know. I'm standing up there, big grown man, you know, 70 years old, you know, crying like a baby, you know, boom. Mm. I mean, hurt me to death, you know. So. But we we were there, but just look at all the champions, Jim Harrison. It's it's quite the list. Oh but, my so, God! What what do you have going on now? Are you still te- teaching and training? I'm doing seminars and uh, okay. travel. I'm the commissioner of my traditional World Karate Association that I started back in '75 when I seen karate going downhill, Jeremy. Mm-hmm. When Master Triss. Start getting too loose, too lax, and start letting all the Koreans coming in, getting high rank over everybody else, and they not knowing basic techniques and knowing kata and didn't know how to fight and everything else, and permitting them uh, to get away with murder, as to say, 
with bad technique, bad karate. And then there was June Ree. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, June Ree came Uh-oh. up with that a gear and stuff. But at June Ree's tournament in 67, I was in the top four. We were supposed to have a round robin. <laughs> June Ree would not even permit me to fight for first and second, the round robin. Two fights. The winner fight for first and second, the loser fight for third and fourth. That was the way we did it, right? Mm. Probably still do, you know. Mm. But no, he wanted this other guy, Joe Lewis, who was a Marine who just came to his tournament and he wanted to uh, let him fight because he was a Marine for first and second. And, and this other guy told me that I had to fight for third and fourth. Why? Because I had defeated the All Korean Champion <clears throat> at June Rees tournament. The All Korean Champion had a delegation from Korea. Their government paid for him to come. About sixteen of them. He standing up against the wall, putting his foot all up over the wall and stuff. And everybody said, "Uh huh, Vic, look who you're gonna have to fight." I say, "Yeah, but that wall don't hit back. I hit back." Oh, <laughs> he said, "Kage, you wait till you have to fight that Korean." I treat that Korean worse than I treated anybody. I spun him around. I snatched him. I swept him. He went up in the air to do a jump kick. I went up in the air and kicked him out of the air. That's one match that I remember to this day, you know. Well, they wanted to fight. They were going to ride. They called the highway patrol in, the sheriff in, the city police. They all in there thinking, I said, we don't need no escort. Me and my students, we carried samurai swords because I did demonstration with them. I'm one of the first ones to start cutting a potato off of a guy's throat with a samurai sword without touching them, cutting the water and going off the stomach. And we had all our weapons and stuff. We said, we don't need no bodyguards. You know, if they want to fight, they can fight. You know, all the Koreans, they group together. Folks are going to jump us and say, well, let them come on. But uh, that's how prejudiced things were, and they hated my guts. The Koreans uh, probably still do hate Vic Moore. Mm-hmm. Well, Henry Cho never would let me come to some of his tournaments because I had defeated the all-Korean champion. I defeated everybody. I'm beating everybody. Now, Vic, you don't want enough tournaments. Uh, we're going to let somebody else uh, win. Uh, I got disqualified at one of the Korean tournaments up in Wisconsin. Uh, a full contact tournament for hitting too hard. What kind of crap is that, you know? So I quit even going to any Korean tournaments, you know. But that's some of the history, the background. So, yeah. you know, I, I've done it. But like I said, we used to go to tournaments. They tell us we're not going to win. Vic Moore, you're not going to win. I say, how are you going to stop me? Well, we got three out of five judges, or two out of three. <laughs> In other words, they can dominate what they want to call and what they're not going to call. Right. There were times I couldn't go in the hotels, as I was stating. <clears throat> I go to New York. I had to stay with Thomas Le Puppet at his house because they wouldn't give blacks a room in hotels a lot of times, and in Chicago and all. I uh, couldn't go in the restaurant and eat. You go to a tournament, you can't go in the restaurant and eat. Uh, you have to ride on the back of the bus, you know. Uh, yeah. A lot of these blacks don't know I paid the way. Huh? When they see me coming in and then I win these tournaments and stuff, then they start looking at them a lot different. But then they get jealous and don't want you to win their tournament because they already got their pick. That's... Uh, Steve Sanders, you know, Muhammad, he's in Atlanta, Georgia now. Ask Jimmy Jones up in Chicago. Uh, ask Russ Perron, who's in Oklahoma or Colorado out there. Uh, look them guys up and ask them. They can tell you the same story. And I ain't the only one. I might have been the first one to pave the way. And the first one, Steve Sanders, Muhammad, started an association called the Black Karate Federation because they teased it him so bad and so many minorities, he started association uh, because of that. Wow. Yeah. 
Well, I want to. We're definitely going to have to have you back on another time and talk. I know we just scratched the surface. Um, for listeners out there, Grandmaster Moore and I talked last week just so I could get some context for what we'd talk about today. And I think we spent about 90 minutes going over a, a ton of stuff that we didn't even talk about today. I'll tell you what is of interest, too, is like you was asking sure. some of my best matches, but uh, I can, at a later date, you know go over some of the matches of uh, how I used to fight these different champions and all. And yeah, that, that, we that would be do, fascinating. What techniques I used to do. And Master Trius used to tell me he wanted me to win with certain techniques, and I had to win the match with that technique. It may have been a hook kick. It may have been a junk uh, scissors kick. And... Now, why would he do that? What was his, uh, he, his goal? He wanted to see how certain techniques worked against uh, Mike Stone and Joe Lewis and Bill okay. Wallace and all. Uh, he had an abundance of knowledge more than anybody. And he wanted to see how certain stances, certain techniques work. Vic, you got to work from the snake all the way down the snake. You look at some of my old matches and stuff, how low I'm in the ground or or I'm all the way down in a snake or I'm up on one leg in the crane stance or or the technique that I'm using, jump kicks, and, uh, double kick, double side kick, and I had to win with a double side kick. Mm. Oh, I mean, he... Ooh. He, he used to send me through the meal, I tell you. But I loved him. He taught me how to do the techniques. So. That, that certainly comes through. You've spoken um, with a lot of reverence about him. But I want to give people the opportunity if they want to learn more about you. You mentioned that you you have an association uh, and, and you offer some seminars. Are those, is there information available on the Internet for yeah, people to look at? Mm-hmm. T-W-K-A. Okay standing for Traditional World Karate Association. And uh, it's under TWKA, and they can join the association. I keep up with my members on a biweekly basis, or at least a monthly basis. I give classes over the phone and through Skype and all. Mm -hmm. I take you through stances and techniques like what I was telling you about on the phone, how to stop, how to get in, how to position your body, there are certain ways you can position your body and a person can't even hardly touch it. Everybody fight, you know, jumping up and down. When a man is jumping up and down, he's off balance. So you time him, you know, when he's up in the air, he ain't doing nothing. It's when he come down, you know. Right. So he's jumping forward and back, forward and back. When he jump back, he ain't doing nothing. You can put your fingers in your ears and go, la, 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 la. And then when he come forward, you bring your guards out. I mean, uh, this day and time, people don't even know karate. I get on the Internet and I say 75% of you don't even know what karate is about. You're jumping up and down, street fighting, slapping, you're boxing. Boxing don't have the same technique that karate does. That's a different art. Right. You can't be running around the ring and call yourself doing karate. You fight from a stance in the art of karate. So we'll get into it sometime, and like I, yeah. said, I know the audience would like to hear how I fought some of these guys or what kata I ran and uh, how you ran in kata contests and the weapons, what weapons. And You can't throw your weapon up in the air and catch it behind your back and think you're going to get a, uh, a real score in karate. What is your opponent doing while it's up in the air, waiting on it to come down? <laughs> when you touch it behind your back, what they doing, waiting on you to bring it around to the front? Come on. When you rolling on the floor, what they got to do? Stand still? They can't stump you and jump down on you? You're doing a backward flip? But why don't they jump in and throw a kick to your ribs while you're flipping in the air and stuff? You're bringing up a subject that's that's started to come up more and more in these episodes, and it's... Um... It's interesting to hear hear your take on it too. It, it's something that uh, you know it's becoming a theme, and um, you know it sounds like that association, the TWKA. You mentioned that that 
your instructor had founded that. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, to... Vic Moore, he don't like ballet. Vic Moore, he don't <laughs> like gymnastics. I took ballet when I was in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I wasn't that great at it, but I studied ballet. Sure. I was on my gymnastic team, which we were all state at Hughes High School in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I like the gymnastics. I like ballet. Baton, trailing the baton, throwing it up in the air, catching it behind your back. I used to love to see the uh, drum major, Red, and the uh, 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 girls doing their baton, trailing while I was on the football team. My coach used to say, Vic, come on, pay attention to the sneaky to the play. You up there watching the drum major throwing up his, you know. It was fascinating. <laughs> but I don't want to see all that crap in my karate. I don't want to see ballet in my karate. I don't want to see gymnastics in my karate. I want to see karate in my karate. Right. Um, well well said, and I don't know that I could I could say it any better as as I've – mentioned in previous episodes, I love gymnastics. I, I, I do gymnastics, I coach gymnastics, but I think you said it pretty well, you know, gymnastics is gymnastics and, and martial arts is martial arts and, and um, there may be a bit too much overlap these days. But you mentioned also some seminars. Is the information on the seminars also available at, at that TWPA Well, my TWPA number is there. People's welcome to give me a call. I do answer my phone. I do chat with people every day. I'm I'm on the phone two or three times a day chatting with people from all over the country. I talk to white belts, brown belts, and black belts, and masters. I speak with everybody. They want advice. Uh, they want to hear some of my war stories, you know, and all. And I'll sit and talk with them. So I'm on the phone quite frequently. Well... Uh, we're going to make sure that we link to your association and your information from the show notes at, at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com so people can, can get a hold of you and learn more about you. And, and also and, some of the info and demonstrations is on YouTube. Yep. The man that fought them all, Vic Moore, the man that fought them all. I was just watching that video yesterday. And if you look at it closely, you'll see Bruce Lee never came close to me. And they show it over and over, and it's the same technique. Somebody wrote Vic, uh, Bruce Lee to eight or nine punches of Vic Moore, and he couldn't stop none of them. That's a bold face tale. <laughs> he threw three punches, and I do three. <laughs> well, I, I think it's it's pretty clear in listening to you tell your stories that, you, that you, there's nothing that you need to exaggerate. Um, you know, I... I yeah, I did yeah, everything exactly. I needed. Uh, Jeremy, I've done enough in my lifetime that I don't have to exaggerate, and I darn sure ain't going to lie. And, and and no one should, and, and I think it's it's amazing that you're willing to tell all these stories. Um, and, and, and thank you for telling them. So let's let's wind down now. The, the last real thing I'd, I'd like to ask you to do, and, and again, we'll find a time to to bring you on again but do you have any parting advice there's a lot of martial artists listening and, and is there something you'd like to offer them for advice oh yeah my main uh uh saying and what i want to be noted for is i want to see traditional karate come back to at least halfway where it used to be i want to see people doing real karate down in a stance, executing karate technique. People don't even know what a stance is. They're jumping up and down. They don't know what a rear chain is. They don't know what a shoot toe is. They don't know anything about breathing, the three levels of breathing. They don't know about bone alignment, punching with the first two knuckles, being in line with the wrist and the elbow in a straight line, the recoil of the opposite hand. They don't know about meditation, it's where your speed comes from, being light, concentration, where your power comes from, focusing through a person and all. They don't get all of these elements. They go to a dojo, they put on the pad, they kick a bag, they spar around with each other, and they go home and they say they had a karate class. They haven't had a bit more karate class than the man in the moon. 
they don't know how to kick with the ball or the foot. Everybody's kicking with the toes and the end step. You hit that dorsal nerve, paralyze your foot for life. But because you got the pads on, you don't have those injuries, you know. And when uh, Jim Reed came out with those pads and stuff, he didn't come out with them for us to make contact and hit. No, he did not. It was for safety if you slip and hit the person. Not for us to hit, to make contact. In reality, karate is a non-contact sport. It used to be a time if you can't stop within a fraction of an inch, you can't compete because you don't have the control. They don't know mm -hmm. that. They think karate is hitting. They think it's kickboxing. They think it's boxing. It is not. So that's what I want to see, and that's what our organization is about, is to teach you stances. Diagonal stance, back stance, cat stance, all these stances, all the blocks. You don't even see a person blocking in karate nowadays. They don't even know what a block is, or we just cover up this. Covering up is not doing karate, it's blocking. Right. So that's what I would say to them, is start teaching real karate. Well, we don't get a point for doing this technique and that technique, so I don't teach it. Well, just because you don't get a point in a tournament, it's no reason for you not to share that knowledge with your students. Because karate deals more than just tournaments. On the street, there is no rules. Right. And the technique that you don't like may be the student's best technique to save her life or his life one day on the street. My instructor used to, to tell us that if there was a technique that didn't work for us, that we still had a responsibility to learn it and, and try to master it because you never knew who you were going to be teaching and what would work for them. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I'm, well, I'm available. I'm reachable. You know, so if anybody want to contact me and chat with me or uh, want to have a seminar or whatever, I'm more than welcome. And that, that's incredible, and I hope people take you up on that offer. It's It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And, and I say that, you know, because see, when I was coming up, you couldn't sit and talk to a black belt. You couldn't mm -hmm. go in the same room with these high-ranking black belts. Right. <laughs> so I'm available. And here, cool. Well, Grandmaster Moore, I really, really appreciate your time. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, well, I appreciate you even having the consideration to even speak with me. Thanks for listening to Episode 20 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you to Grandmaster Moore for his time and his absolutely wonderful stories. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if you could help us by leaving a five-star review wherever you download your podcast, it would make a big difference. Those reviews help new listeners find the show, and you might hear us read yours on the air. If we do, go ahead and email us at info at whistlekick.com, and you'll get a free prize pack, including a shirt, water bottle, stickers, and more. You know, we'll even pay the ship. You can check out the show notes with photos, video, and links to everything we talked about today at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. In fact, if you typically skip the show notes on the website, this would be a good one to go look at. As we were putting this episode together, we kept finding more things that warranted sharing. And while you're over there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter so you can keep up on everything Whistlekick. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. And while you're at it, check out the great stuff we have at Whistlekick.com. Gear, shirts, pants, and a whole bunch more. All made for martial artists by martial artists. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.